the Tavistock Gender Clinic is facing a class action lawsuit from patients who say they were let down and permanently altered by treatment from the Gender Identity Development Service. Allegations include recklessly prescribing puberty blockers and taking an unquestioning affirmative approach to children who identified as transgender. Law firm Pogast Goodhead is spearheading the mass legal action. Their global managing partner, Tom Goodhead, joins us now. Good morning to you. Good morning. Um, can you give us an idea of uh, the numbers here? Is it true to say that you're expecting around 1,000 former patients to join this class action? Yes. I mean, it's hard to put a precise number on it now, but we we run over 25 very large class actions from our firm, and we've got you know, decades and decades of experience in the size of these groups um, that sign up. It's difficult because, of course, this has been a topic which has been um, very much taboo in the public sphere until um, quite recently. And there's a very poor quality of data, which is one of the things which um, Dr. Cass identified in her in her interim report, the um, percentage of those um, who have undergone um, these treatment pathways who subsequently detransition or who, who regret it, or long-term evidence in respect of the um, effect of, uh, of puberty blockers and then people who almost inevitably continue on to sex hormone treatment mm. it is still unknown. So we are having to um, use estimates, but I mean, even judging from my, from my inbox and the reaction uh, this morning to this, I, I think this is going to be one of the uh, largest uh, medical negligence scandals of all time. Right. And, and Tom, do you have any kind of idea, you talked about percentages there, of, um, uh, you know, these, these are clearly the people who are unhappy with what happened, but do we know as a proportion how many people were, were, were happy with the treatment that they got? It's contested figures. I mean, in terms of detransitioning, we've seen, you know, there will be people who very much advocate for this sort of gender mm. um, affirming treatment pathways who will say that the percentage is extraordinarily low, 0.1, 0.2%. 0 there are figures bandied around of 8, 9, 10% in terms of uh, detransitioning. I think the real difficulty is, is just when the, the long term impacts simply aren't known. And then secondly, again, one of the criticisms um, from Dr. Cass in the interim report has been the failure to follow um, people's journeys after having received um, these, these clinical interventions. So mm. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to be evasive on that point, but it no. genuinely is very difficult to know. Of course. Um, the reason I suppose I'm asking is that there are people who've got in touch with us and who have said, um, whenever we discuss this, that um, that, that uh, not as good uh, kind of substandard treatments do exist Bad experiences happen, uh, but some experiences are good. Um, Sarah, who's texted us, uh, she's in Kent. Uh, she says, uh, I am the mother of a transgender and I have nothing but praise for the Tavistock who gave my child the help that she needed when no one else would. I'm just reading that out verbatim. Um, so the balance here, I suppose, is that some children are genuinely trans and deserve proper treatment, but so do ch gender dysphoric children who aren't trans and and what we learn from this of course is how these clinics can do better yes i mean it, it's it's obviously an extraordinarily sensitive um subject and, and no one would ever want to walk in the shoes of of, of one person who who finds that the treatment they received was positive and another mm. who finds it negative i think one has to stand back and look at this and and look at it at a macro level in terms of um what have been identified as extraordinary systemic failings in terms of the way that treatment has been um, has been delivered and the complete lack of evidence uh, for the affirmation only model of, of treatment, which was effectively being um, followed by by by, by the Tavistock. Mm. And that, you know, I, I just find that we've allowed, I think, in, a, in effect, what, what appears to be um, an ideological capture um, of a clinic rather than actually following evidence based um, healthcare, which provides the foundations for for the delivery of uh, of all other um, all other types of healthcare under the NHS. And what are the the kind of the main allegations of the people that you're representing so far? Is it, for example, that if they they took pu puberty blockers but didn't have surgery and then wished to reverse it, that they were they were concerned about that kind of thing? No, it, it's not at that level of specificity yet. I mean, we 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 are launching the action. It's something that we've been investigating for. Um, over a over a year now, um, everybody who comes forward is going to have different um, different uh, personal circumstances. I, I think that certainly may well be be one of the um, mm. natures of the complaints. But a lot of this is going to revolve um, around um, whether or not there was there was evident an evidence base 
um, to have been providing these um, these these treatment pathways in in the first place. And I think the one of the um, one of the most difficult elements of this case is as you as you raised yourself, it is people who who present with um, with, with with certain beliefs or with mm. a, with a certain um, sense of an identity. It, it's whether that sort of affirmation of it and then a, a sort of a presentation that should almost unquestionably lead to a um to, to a diagnosis and then a clinical intervention or whether um, you know we have people presenting with with, with a huge range of uh, of, of neurodiversity or, or, or questions over um, right. over their over their identity or, or their sexual orientation or or all sorts of um, all sorts of um, presentations and, and I think that's going to be one of the, the main issues. Yeah.